Let me ask you something. What is the evidence for evidence? How do we know which type of medical knowledge is best in each situation? And how do we invite medical students to always remain critical of the way they integrate medical knowledge with medical expertise? My name is Mario Veen. I'm the action editor of the Philosophy in Medical Education series of the journal Teaching and Learning in Medicine. In a previous episode, we discussed the relationship between teaching and learning in the context of philosophy of education. So I think it makes sense that in this episode we will discuss philosophy of science and to be precise, epistemology and evidence-based medicine. We will discuss the article Teaching Medical Epistemology within an Evidence-Based Medical Curriculum with the authors Mark Tonelli and Robin Bloom. My co-host for this episode is Nabila Mayat, and you can find the article in the description. Well, we're in four different time zones at the moment. Robin is in Michigan, Mark in Seattle, Nabila in the UK, and I am in the Netherlands. Let me introduce our guests. Robin Bloom is an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at Lyman Briggs College at Michigan State University. Her research examines the relationship between epistemological and ethical issues in medicine and neuroscience. She is a co-editor of the Bloomsbury Companion to Philosophy of Psychiatry and of the International Journal of Feminist Approaches to Bioethics. So, Robin, we're going to speak about the branch of philosophy called epistemology. But what is epistemology and why does it have your particular interest? Um, so, first of all, epistemology is uh, from the Greek for uh, theory of knowledge or study of knowledge. Um, I actually became interested in epistemology and more specifically philosophy of science. Um, because as an undergraduate, I was a science student. Um, my first undergraduate degree was in neuroscience and I found that I was more interested in questions about how scientists get knowledge and use knowledge and what counts as a good theory or good evidence than I was in actually learning about how the brain works. I was interested in that too. But I realized that um, the things that really interest me are, are questions about how to look at how scientific theories are built or how scientists adjudicate disagreements between them about the evidence. Um, and it, later on, I became more interested in that in the context of medicine, which makes things even more complicated because the, the stakes are higher. So scientists are interested in how the world works and you're interested in how scientists figure out how the world works. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. And I would like to think that um, philosophers actually do have a contribution to make to this as well, that we tend to be very good at picking out situations where scientists might be talking past each other or using words in ways that um, are not always concrete or not always consistent with other things that they do. I um, found that I was really interested in reading about science and thinking about it more than I was in actually doing it in the lab. You wrote this uh, article together with Mark Tonelli. Mark Tonelli is professor of medicine and adjunct professor of bioethics and humanities in the School of Medicine at the University of Washington in Seattle. He works as a critical care physician and his scholarship focuses on clinical decision-making, particularly the epistemic pluralism required for case-based reasoning. So Mark, what is that epistemic pluralism? So as Robin said, epistemology is about knowledge and um, epistemic pluralism says, particularly in medicine, that there are a lot of different kinds of knowledge that um, clinicians should be using uh, in making medical decisions. Um, and that's an area that became uh, a specific area of interest for me back when evidence-based medicine was introduced about the time when I was finishing my own medical training uh, and fellowship. Um, in that, you know, the, the reliance on published clinical research, um, while it had many advantages, also seemed to devalue other types of medical knowledge um, that 
seem to be very important for clinical decision making, medical knowledge that came from our understanding of pathophysiology, or that kind of um, uh, medical knowledge that you gain from taking care of patients. Uh, and that experiential knowledge seemed to be devalued. And so I became very interested in thinking about that in a more formal sense. And part of what we'll talk about, how, how can we teach clinicians to value and incorporate different kinds of medical knowledge and understand the strengths and weaknesses of different kinds of medical knowledge when it comes to taking care of patients. Um, and as a professor in a medical school, I interact with medical students and residents and fellows on a regular basis. And so this is um, an important question for me in my daily activity as well. And how does it feature in your daily activity? <laughs> Well, one of the one of the interesting things that you know your audience of medical educators will recognize is that when you're a clinician and and practicing in um, a training environment and attending in a training environment is that you have to get used to um, smart people asking you very hard questions every single day, and that every one of your clinical decisions um, is subject to review, um, and. So it becomes very important to be able to explain why you're making such decisions. That is, um, I think the best uh, clinicians, the, the, the people we value for their clinical reasoning skills ought to be able to make that explicit um, and be able to tell you how they're reaching the conclusions that they're reaching. And that often requires, you know, essentially an epistemic analysis, going back to look and say, here is the knowledge that I'm relying upon for this. And here's how I'm valuing that. And here's how I'm weighting that because there may be conflicting um, uh, pieces uh, or, or different understanding when I look at the clinical research compared to my experience, for instance, and how am I going to weight those things when I'm making this decision? I think if we're going to train people to be good clinical reasoners, uh, we should be able to make that reasoning explicit and, and epistemology, understanding epistemology, I think is crucial for that. That's great because we have a good clinical reasoner here, Nabila Mayat. She's my co-host today and she's a final year medical student at Barts at the, and the London School of Medicine and Dentistry. And she also has a Bachelor of Science in Medical Education. And uh, Nabila, as I understand it, you try to work towards professional identity formation in any conversation, any chance you get, right? <laughs> So have you found any connection yet between uh, the topic of this article and professional identity formation? Um, have, why have I not thought about that yet? Okay, um, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> to be honest, I think, I think the epistemology, just the whole thing is just, I think the way that I think about it is in the sense that I link it to myself and my own journey through my placements in the sense that when I read this paper and I was learning about, like I was reading about epistemology and experiential knowledge, I was thinking about how I've changed through medical school in the sense of the kind of knowledge I look for. And I've noticed how right at the beginning of medical school, I used to look for very, what is in the books and very like things to a point. And I don't really, I used to get confused because you'd have different clinicians doing the same clinical examination in different methods. And I'd be like, someone just tell me the right answer. Like, how do I get there? Um, well, as now I'm the complete opposite. Now I don't want you to tell me what's in the books. If I can get it on Google or in a book, I don't want to know because I can just do that myself. What I look out for now is experiential knowledge where I'll be looking at the doctor and I'll be like, what's going through your head? And why have you chosen to do this and not this? And why do you like this medication and not this one where it does the same stuff? Things like that. But what I have found myself doing is over time I'll start thinking wait how how do I know if you're the right one or you're the right one because <laughs> you prefer this one and you prefer this one who do I go for hmm. um and I think all of that that sense of like questioning and looking and analyzing different people different people's methods of down to how they act as a clinician but also like the decisions they make and the physical like prescribing and things that they do that I think all of that contributes to my identity and therefore being aware of the epistemology of like the knowledge I'm taking in and the things I'm learning and integrating into myself, I think is very important towards who I become in the future, which is hopefully a doctor. <laughs>
but yeah. <laughs> mm. So that's that's interesting that you see the way you look at knowledge is part of of kind of the person you are and you, your professional identity. Yeah. Part of my professional yeah. identity formation, so to say. <laughs> Great. And yeah, I brought it in. Yes, you brought it in right at the start. And I'm sure you find uh, two or three other opportunities. Um, but yeah, let's discuss the article. Nabila, where, where shall we start? I think what I want to ask first is, I understand you've explained this a little bit already, but how would you best describe the term epistemology and why is it important that we look at it? Um, so as I, I mentioned earlier, epistemology translates to theory of knowledge or the study of knowledge. And um, while a hardcore epistemologist would say that if it's not good knowledge, it's not knowledge. But as a person who comes to philosophy of science, from, or epistemology from philosophy of science, I think that there's some more um, subtle questions to be asked about um, how uh, firm a particular base of knowledge is or how certain we can be about a particular fact and in medicine in particular how well we can count on knowledge to guide action. Um, so I see epistemology as being um, in, in this context a way of thinking about the ways that people go about getting knowledge in um, clinical trials or in the lab or in the clinic. And when they know that that knowledge is actually secure enough that they can use it um, in different circumstances or consistently. And what I found interesting there is when you said that if it's not good, like how hardcore epistemologists would say, if it's not good knowledge, it's not knowledge. I sense like a sense of debate there. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I was just wondering, like, yeah. where do you stand on that? Because to me, if it's not good knowledge, it's bad knowledge, which means it's still knowledge. And also, <laughs> wouldn't it depend on who's asking? I, I'm going to <laughs> Plato now. <laughs> <laughs> this went meta really quickly, right? Um, so the traditional <laughs> view of knowledge and philosophy is that knowledge is justified true belief. Um, so we have to believe something for it to be knowledge. We have to have good reasons or justification, and it has to be true. And I think that when we talk about specific things, like the wall behind me is yellow, it's a lot easier to figure out what it means to say that that's a true statement than it is when you're saying something like um, medication X uh, is useful in condition Y for between 64 and 78% of patients. Mm -hmm. how, how do you map that onto something like the wall is yellow? Um, and, you know, if, if we're thinking about that, and then we think not just about the statement that medication X is good for condition Y, but also how we came to believe that, we may well have good justification, but we also know that it's true in sort of a provisional sense. So it's true that this is what this trial or these trials have found. We don't necessarily know how true it's going to be or how this, um, how much confidence we should have in using that medication in this particular patient. So truth, I think, gets a lot messier when you're not talking about simple statements, but you're talking about the results of really complex studies. Right. And as a clinician, Mark, I feel like you, you'd you navigate a lot of that sense of truth, especially when it comes to medication and it works for this percentage of people. How do you find navigating that? Yeah, and I think we'll probably talk about that more specifically as we go forward. Mm. But I think one of the one of the advantages that clinicians have is that they can appeal to sort of different types of knowledge, knowing that that um, you know, anything that we're appealing to might not always be good, right? We'll talk about, you know, randomized controlled trials and the idea that that's best evidence, but somehow, sometimes that's always, that's difficult to apply to individual patients for a wide variety of reasons, right? You know, going from a study that, that demonstrates maybe something about causality uh, to saying that we should be using a particular intervention for a particular patient is a huge leap. It's an epistemic leap. Um, and so the good thing about being a clinician is you can appeal to other things as well, right? You can appeal to your, your 
experiential knowledge, right? You might be able to appeal to your own experiential knowledge as you develop clinical expertise, but you might also be able to appeal to that if some of your colleagues who are experts in particular areas, um, you can fall back on all that pathophysiologic you know, information that you acquired, that knowledge that you acquired in uh, earlier in your training um, and understanding how the body works um, and uh, how it responds to different interventions. Um, and you have to put all of that together to try to come up with what is the best course of action for a particular patient. Um, and so, um, and, there, and both Robin and I are gonna, you know, have, have argued that there's not one type of knowledge that's always best. Um, and that the, the case, uh, an individual, in any individual case, you may be appealing to multiple types of knowledge um, and um, one type may be better in one case and, and not in another. So uh, I do think that we should be able to then be as, clini as clinicians and particularly as medical educators able to say, this is, this is how I'm processing this. These are, the, these are the things that I'm appealing to. Um, this is the knowledge that I'm appealing to, and this is how I'm weighing them differently. And when you brought up earlier, how, which clinician should you believe? Um, you know, you should be able to, to get them to be explicit about why they, why they seem to be doing different things um, uh, in a similar situation. Um, one of my colleagues has always said, we, we don't disagree about the evidence, right? We, we generally disagree about... Um, we might have different priors, right? How much we really believe the evidence uh, is, is relevant in this situation. And we also weight evidence differently and knowledge differently. Um, and so somebody may be relying more on their experience than they are relying on a clinical trial uh, and vice versa. So, but people should be able to make that explicit. And that's how we, you know, we, how we learn and how we teach. And um, I think how we become better clinicians. You said earlier about, um being aware of what type of knowledge you're taking in. Um, that reminds me of, if you've heard of that, do the thing where you have conscious competence, um, unconscious competence, like the, the four stages of learners, where it's unconscious mm -hmm. incompetence, conscious incompetence, <laughs> conscious competence, and which one's left? Unconscious competence. So it reminded me of that in the sense that when we're taking in knowledge, especially like when we're taking it into our decision-making and things like that, is it more important to be consciously competent of what we're taking in rather than the unconscious autopilot just taking in knowledge and just taking it as is rather than questioning and thinking about it? Do you think that's a good way to think about this? I think that there's, um, you're getting to an issue that comes up a lot that there's that in clinical practice, right? That there is some tacit understanding that's important for being a clinician, right? You know, mm. where I, somebody says, I'm an ICU physician and I say, that patient's dying, all right? And somebody says, why, how do you know that patient's dying? And I'm <laughs> like, I've been doing this while I, that patient is dying, right? And, and, if I, and if I can't tell you exactly why I'm conscious of that, um, I can at least say that's a, I'm relying on this tacit understanding that I've developed over time. But I should more often than not be able to tell you, you know, why I am making a particular clinical decision, what, what warrants I'm, you know, bringing to bear, what, what knowledge I'm bringing to bear, and, and hopefully be able to explain that to you. I do think that it's a, it is a fine balance between, right, respecting the ex clinical expertise and then this idea of that, that evidence-based medicine is always sort of railed against the uh, you know, authoritarian clinician who does it, when you ask them why they do it that way, they say that's because that's the way I do it, right? And it's not, there is no um, explanation. Why are you as the, you know, as the student or the registrar gonna be you know, um, doing it? Because that's the way I do it. That's not a very compelling, um, warrant for action or it shouldn't be right um so so i do believe that there is there the clinical expertise does uh, often have this tacit element that comes from you know experiential primary experiential knowledge um and it can be difficult to articulate we should be at least be able to articulate when we're relying on it and then you or anybody else i'm work, you know working with can say well you know you're kind of lousy at this um in the past <laughs> You told me that last person was dying and they're like, they left the hospital a day later, you know, or they can, you know, you might be able to say, um, 
uh, yes, I trust your I trust your judgment in a sense. What I'm trying to figure out is whether your criticism of evidence-based medicine, actually, that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is it is it a criticism of evidence-based medicine and how it deals with uh, knowledge, or is it kind of a crit, uh, being critical about evidence-based medicine, but from the insides? The the little little I know about evidence-based medicine is the EBM triad. So you have the uh, the scientific evidence. Uh, the clinical expertise, and uh, we talked about th those two already. And then we have the patient's uh, values. I, I worked at the GP vocational training, and there's uh, a lot of emphasis there about how in a consultation with a patient, you're integrating these three different parts. So when I listen to that description of EBM, it kind of sounds like what you're saying as well, that there should be an integration between these uh, three uh, I don't know if these are three different forms of knowledge, but they're at least di three different sources of knowledge from your own expertise and experience as a clinician, from uh, the, the scientific uh, papers that you read, and from the person who's sitting uh, in front of you. My question is, is your critique or the critique that you think students should take to uh, evidence-based medicine, is it from the inside or from the outside of EBM? Um, so I think it's both and really that, um, I mean, obviously I'm an outsider to evidence-based medicine as a philosopher, um, but at the same time, it's, I, I think that all of the criticisms that I've made and that Mark have made have been very much constructive criticisms and intended to, um, you know, be, be helpful. I, I have in a couple of places described evidence-based medicine as being um, sort of akin to Churchill's defense of democracy. It's, democracy is the worst form of government ever, except for all the other ones that we've tried. <laughs> um, but, and I think that's true of EBM. I think that, you know, in its early days in particular, that EBM has really um, hooked onto a serious problem with medicine that students were just being taught to do what they were told to, you know, look at the right expert and do what they said to go back to Nebula's point. Um, but in terms of the triad, I think that EBM has also very much focused only on one portion of the triad, which is the clinical evidence. So, you know, you see the hierarchy of evidence, which clearly says randomized controlled trials of treatments much better than physiological studies. And so they're being inconsistent in saying, well, of course, the physiological studies are an important part of the triad, we need to know pathophysiology, but also, they're not as good as randomized trials. Um, and then, you know, similarly, for clinical judgment, it ranks very low on the hierarchy of evidence, but it still comes in as part of the triad. And then the other thing is that EBM just says you have to integrate these things, but they're really not very good at saying how to do that. So, Mark's work in particular has been really focused on thinking about how that actually gets done and trying to articulate it and make it explicit. So there is something in EBM that clearly states you should integrate this, but uh, exactly how to do that is uh, still not clear. I've given talks about uh, these issues to clinicians for 20 years. And at the end of those talks, I've had clinicians come up to me and say, that's heresy. How can you be, you know, um, how can you be attacking evidence-based medicine like that? And I've had other clinicians come up to me and say, that's evidence-based medicine. That's how I practice. I'm an evidence-based medicine practitioner. You just describe my practice. Um, and I've gotten to the point where I frankly don't care whether it's evidence-based medicine or not. And I think as Robin said, it's both from within and from without. And I think that's what we need to help teach you know, students is to is to not simply accept evidence-based medicine as um, as the the way to look at the world, um, but to be as skeptical about evidence-based medicine as evidence-based medicine is telling them to be skeptical about clinical research results, for instance. Um, and then and then to I I do think help helping evidence-based medicine with areas where it's not particularly good and and this description of integration it simply leaves alone. It often just says you need to integrate this with your clinical expertise. And by the way, we're not gonna really talk about what clinical expertise is and you need to integrate it with the patient's you know, goals, values, and frankly, experience. Um, but we're not gonna really tell you exactly how to do that. We'll leave that, we'll leave that to you. And, and I think we need to spend time talking about how that um, should happen.
one of the points that I really loved from the paper was um, the idea of being an evidence user versus being evidence-based. So if I think about that, I'm an evidence user learning in the world of evidence-based medicine. And being a student in um, navigating the placement world, I feel like I'm turning into someone that's going to be an evidence user. And so I'll be one of these people who are taking on this knowledge and need to think properly about what knowledge to take on and what's good to take on for for future patients. Would you be able to talk a bit more about that idea of being evidence-based versus an evidence user? Um, I think this is another real tension within evidence-based medicine as it was developed, especially in its early days. If you go back and you read the 1992 paper published in JAMA that introduced EBM that was done, that was written by the EBM working group at McMaster University. They talk about a resident going to the library and finding studies and reading them and really thinking, how does this apply to my patient? Does this apply to my patient? And, you know, if you read some of Ross Upshur's work about his time in medical school at McMaster, he talks about people challenging others to provide their evidence for decision and there's for a decision. And there's this real sense that, you know, you can get in and wallow in the evidence and really think about how it works. And then, you know, not too long after that, the EBM folks started publishing things saying, well, you know, it turns out that physicians in clinical practice don't have a lot of time to look at the evidence. They can't even keep up with, you know, reading the abstracts of papers, much less digging into the weeds and going and doing library searches on their own. And not only that, but a lot of them don't want to. So this is where they make the distinction between an evidence-based practitioner and an evidence user. And an evidence user just takes um, summarized and pre-digested, you know, what used to be called clinical pearls. I don't know if they use that terminology anymore. Now they're evidence-based clinical pearls, I guess. Um, and, you know, they, they want what you said you wanted early in medical school. They want to know what the answer is, and then they want to use it in practice. Um, but that's a long way from the other, you know, really exciting in um, building skills in evidence assessment. And I think that tension is just always going to be there. I don't really know how to solve it, but um, at the very least, I think teaching students to realize that there's a tension and to know what kind of work goes into digesting and summarizing the evidence is incredibly important, even if they do just end up being off the shelf evidence users. Yeah, I think about the idea of teaching students about this tension is very important and not something I have considered much. And even then, like, if I wasn't really into medical education, I don't think I ever would have considered it really, um, which is a really sad thought, really, to be, to be honest. Um, so when you were saying about like, and also that was in the intro to the paper about the idea of the introduction to the 1992 mm -hmm. paper, um, of how like a student just sat in a library going through pages, I kind of just wish that I could still do that. I hate that everything's <laughs> on the internet. I want to go into an old antique wooden library, go through papers and journals, which would be really fun. Um, it was really, yes. it was really not fun. It wasn't fun, Nabila. <laughs> I would love it. I would, trust me, I would find it fun. <laughs> With like a candle on the side, a little lantern. Um, but yeah, so that just gets me thinking about how, I think one of the things that draws me towards, because we don't get to learn about this tension um, about evidence users versus evidence based, that's one of the things that got me into identity in the first place was the fact that I wasn't thinking about who I was becoming. And the fact that I had education to think about these things allowed me to wallow in that knowledge and think about, wait, what is actually going on here rather than just becoming this like doctor. Um, and that, and then you were saying about how, thinking about how clinicians might not have the time to go through all the papers, but also some people just don't want to. And from all of this, I think it's really important to see that, like it's really important to learn these things and we can clearly see that. But if we do want to teach students epistemology better and this tension better, how can we make them enjoy? Are there any ways that you think might be a good way to make students enjoy? Because I've had to think about this and yeah, I'm always a bit like, how do you do this? It's hard. <laughs> uh, Nabila, how, how was it in your medical training? Did you have anything about epistemology? And Yes. So we've had lectures, but this was back in the day where 
I'm ashamed at my past self but back then I looked at it and I was like what do you mean how do we know what we know like Mm. I don't care (laughs) I just know (laughs) just let me live (laughs) Um, and I found it very confusing back then I just did not understand what it was on about but I think also because I think because I was a preclinical student at the time and so I didn't value these things I think once you become a clinical student you value the difference in different types of knowledge and experiential knowledge and what you're taking in a lot more um so I think in terms of the challenge of teaching it the challenge would be most present with preclinical students because trust me I was there and I am unrecognizable from who I am now (laughs) because back then I did not care (laughs) which is really bad it's really sad actually um but yeah so how yeah I just don't get how we can teach it to preclinical students because I think the key question when you're in medical school you're in a state of fight or flight and you're always just it's always just like, I need to stay in medical school. I need to not get chucked out and I need to pass the exam. And it's always a case of, is it going to be on the exam rather yeah. than, you know, is this epistemology- is epistemologically <laughs> relevant? Yeah, and just, just, to, just to power on to that, because uh, yeah. at the uh, postgraduate, I work at the postgraduate training uh, for GPs and there, it's a three-year training. And there we've had talks about how to integrate uh, more philosophy of science, uh, epistemology. And one argument that, that I heard a lot there is that we should do that at the, in the final year. Because in the, in the first year, uh, they're just busy with, well, surviving, basically, treating patients. And it seems that, that in your paper, you're actually arguing the opposite. You're arguing that, no, we should start with that right away. Am I correct in this? And how how do we avoid that that it yeah people don't see the relevance? Yeah. So what I think we 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 try to argue for in that paper is that this isn't this isn't we don't want to teach epistemology with a, one class you know where everybody is gonna their eyes are gonna glaze over and say what's gonna be on the test and um, you know uh, and why is this of interest uh, and rec- but but we recognize that different epistemic questions come up at different times in your medical training and they're, and they're more relevant, right? So early on, when you're starting to learn a little bit about evidence-based medicine, I think it's, it's important. You can talk about what is evidence, you know, what is evidence and w- how does evidence-based medicine define it? And is that sufficient? And are there other ways you could think about it, right? So these are kind of just questions that come up when you're learning that. And when people start taking care of patients, other questions come up, right? Um, and, and the integration problem really does tend to come up late. It comes up when people are in graduate medical education where you're working with them, Mario, you know, when it's, when it's this idea of, look, I learned all of this pathophysiology. I learned all of this science. I learned all of these studies. And now I don't know how to, you know, I'm, I'm having trouble making somebody feel better. Um, and how am I? going to integrate that and they're starting to develop some clinical expertise and when do they trust their clinical expertise and when and you know when can they um so i do think these specific questions come up at different times in the med in medical education and we can't try to silo this at one point um it's part of the process of developing your professional identity right so that uh, over time you know, you're becoming a better medical reasoner with each step of the process and your understanding, you can go back as a, as a clinician and say, oh, I'm going to go back and, you know, I'm going to really delve into this decision. um, And I'm going to do an epistemic analysis. I'm going to focus on, you know, what am I really appealing to um, when I'm, when I'm making this decision or why am I having a hard time with this decision, right? There's conflicting knowledge that I have you know, differing warrants that seem to be in conflict. How am I going to resolve that? And if you have the basic understanding and some of the language, and and even just the recognition that you're that you're having an epistemic you're in an epistemic quandary, that will be helpful. So there's not one there's not one class that's going to do this, and there's mm-hmm. not one seminar in graduate medical education that's going to be doing it. And I think a lot of it for me takes place on the wards when you're taking care of patients and you're sitting, you're in a group and trying to decide what you're going to do for a patient um, and being able to take a step back. And if there's, if 
if we're disagreeing, why are we disagreeing? That's really interesting because um, actually the reason I approached you for this series was because of your article uh, that's called A Philosophical Approach to Addressing Uncertainty in Medical Education. Uh, I'll link it in the description. Uh, because uh, what attracted me there is that you make the argument that, well, what you just said, it's not just a separate class. Philosophy can be integrated in the curriculum in all different kinds of ways, and it doesn't have to take extra time. So that's a lot of times the reaction is that people do see the relevance of uh, not just epistemology, but also of ethics and uh, educational philosophy, perhaps. But where is the time? Uh, so that's what I find really attractive about your approach is that if you only introduce it in the third year of postgraduate training, mm -hmm. yes, then you need time because you need to start at the basics. And uh, But if you do it just in little chunks, yeah, there's some um, really nice examples in the paper that you give on how to do that. Um, but I was just thinking, like when you were talking and talking about how we shouldn't just silo it off and it's something that we should develop over the years, I was thinking about how... Well, I got thinking on the train thought of how can how are we teaching this and how it would be great if we could just have sessions where it wasn't like, let's teach you about epistemology in the lecture. It was more like, how do we know this is true? And we're just literally just thinking and pondering because I feel like we don't do that enough anymore. And that made me think about dear children. And I don't know if I'm going completely on the wrong track here, but when you have a child and they ask, why is the sky blue? And you're like, because it is. And then they're like, but how do you know? And they're like, because. And they're like, but why? Isn't that at its heart sort of epistemology? And then I feel like what happens is then you reach a point where you're like, because I'm telling you it's blue. And it's kind of like when we're growing up in society, I feel like we're just, I'm going on a complete tangent here. But I feel like when we grow up in society nowadays, it's so much a case of, but what's the right answer? But what's on the exam? But what's this? And when we're kind of doing away with that sense of wonder and just thinking, but how can it be that the sky is blue? And how is my blue the same as your blue? And what are rainbows and all of these things? Yeah, I think my point is we can teach it. We can teach it at preclinical. It's just how you teach it. Because kids themselves are doing it naturally. So that means we can definitely teach it at preclinical. Mm -hmm. But how are you going to get people to think? That's the important thing. And how do we engage people and, you know, get them to really question things and get interested? I think you could teach anything as long as you just do it the right way and get people interested. That's all that matters. So yeah, that's a red train thought, thought train, thought train led to do. <laughs> so it's funny because everything that you folks are saying, it, it's so true to my experience teaching undergraduates who want to go into medical school. They know it's competitive. They know it's difficult. They want to get the good grades. They're willing to work hard, but they're a little bit afraid to ask the difficult questions or go off on an interesting train of thought. And so maybe the thing to do is start thinking about how undergraduate medical education might be useful so that, you know, they have a foundation of questioning and realizing that knowledge just doesn't get taken off of a shelf somewhere and applied, that it has a history and that, you know, the things that you learn in textbooks are not you know, the things at the time, those might have been really controversial and, um, you know, contested discoveries and, you know, having, I think, some sense that that is the case, even before they get to medical school can only be good um, in much the same way that, you know, a lot of places will require that students have taken a, a medical ethics course before they start medical school. Maybe they should also be taking philosophy of science. In epistemology, there, there's something else that, that at least I've experienced is, I would say, summarize it as humility. Because in whatever context it is, if you start to think about how do I actually know this? You start to become humble as well about uh, making grand claims of, of certainty and, and uh, uh, beyond medicine, uh, just being more aware that, well, it ain't necessarily so. Yeah, and there are... Um... There are philosophers in medicine who have emphasized that maybe one of the skills of, uh, or, or one of the goals of clinical training should be to um, imbue clinicians with some epistemic humility, right? And that epistemic humility is, is, a, is a positive value for a medical practice. And I do think that that's, um, and again, this is one of those things that may run counter a little bit to um, 
a simplistic view of evidence-based medicine, right? Where there's this idea of, well, here's the randomized controlled trial, so that dictates care. Um, and often people are clinging to that because it seems certain and, and it seems true, right? With the capital T, um, because they've been led to believe that that's the case. And it, and it does take some examination to show why that's, um, you know, why that bit of knowledge, and it's usually a bit of knowledge that comes out of a clinical research trial, um, is only part of the issue. And that um, it may not be reliable as you think it is, and it may not be as you know, true with a capital T as you think it is, um, and learning that humility. And I actually, you know, going back to making this interesting for, for people, I actually think, you know, largely in, in medical school, we're working with very smart people, you know, Our, the students are very bright. And these questions often come to them independently. We don't have to raise them. Um, and sometimes it's taking advantage of that opportunity where you know these questions are coming up, right? You know, when people are starting to think about it. I do agree with, um, I think, Robin's implication. Um, in general, I'm biased towards um, people who enter medical school with a background in medical, in, in the humanities, um, as opposed to in science. I do think sometimes it's a little more challenging with people who are coming from um, some of the, you know, hard sciences who they do, there's a, there's a sense that there should be a right answer that, and there should be certainty. Um, and that just doesn't exist in clinical medicine. And so sometimes it's disabusing people of that notion that, that um, there's knowledge in medicine that's certain or that there's, you know, um, or that is always um, easily applicable. But there are plenty of opportunities that pop up. So in terms of the opportunities that pop up, I was thinking, so if I went onto the wards one day and I thought, I read a guideline on something and I was on the wards and the doctor did it another way. And I'd be like, and they say, and I'm just looking at him in confusion, like, what are you doing? The guidelines are saying it like this. Obviously, I wouldn't say anything, <laughs> but- But you should, was... you should, <laughs> you should say I something. I wouldn't though. <laughs> I just sit and <laughs> stay silent in the corner and hide. Um, but mm. if, if there's doctors are saying like, we are doing it differently here, how, how would you deal with that situation? And how would you, um, yeah, how do you deal with that idea of like, this is the way we do it. And when someone else has a right answer and it's like, there's that mismatch there. So I, I look at that as an opportunity to do an epistemic analysis, right? Where somebody holds, holds a paper and says, but this paper suggests, or they will say, this paper says we should do X for this patient. And, and I say, well, we're not gonna do that, um, but here's why. And I, and I know about the paper. Well, maybe every once in a while somebody hands me a paper I've never seen. And I'll go, well, let me read that because maybe that will change my approach here. It's a new bit of knowledge that I now need to incorporate. But it's usually that we, it, it's not usually ignorance of the knowledge that's the difference, right? So then the, it raises the question for, you know, why am I doing this? And, and in some cases it may just be, well, that's the way I do it. And that's a lousy epistemic, that's a lousy reason to do something, right? It's a, it's a weak warrant. It's a weak warrant to say, well, we should do something. But I might say, well, in my experience, and or here's some here are some things about the, this patient's physiology. This happens to me all the time in the ICU, where somebody is saying, "Well, you know, this paper says we should ventilate a person a certain way," and I say, "Well, we're not going to do that in this case, but here's why: because their physiology is different. They're not tolerating that. Um, they're having a complication of that approach. Um, I can see that that's that's going to be an issue, um, but I should be able to explain that." To, to maybe not always to somebody's satisfaction, but at least so that we understand why we're doing it differently. Um, and I would go back to what you said about you would sit in the corner and not ask that question. I think we need a meta, we need a system of medical education where you should always be able to ask that question. And in fact, you should be strongly encouraged to ask that question because that's the only way that you know we can teach this kind of reasoning. If, if otherwise it just seems like it's, you know, it's my authority. And, and as Robin was talking about earlier, one of the problems with being an evidence-based practitioner, right, is that you start to rely on somebody else's, or user, is that you, user, is that you start to rely on, on some other authority to tell you what to do. And um, you should, you should if, you're, if you're gonna do that, either rely on my authority because of my expertise or the authority of up-to-date, um, 
for the Cochrane collaboration, then you should be um, realizing what you're doing. And, and I personally believe that, yeah, all students, and I strongly encourage it in my residents and fellows, like if you don't understand why I'm doing something, you, you, you have to ask. And I will never take that as a personal affront. And I think one of the reasons you may learn not to ask that questions is that some people, some physicians who should know better um, will answer, you know, because that's the way I do it and see that question as a challenge. That question is not a challenge to one's authority or it shouldn't be viewed that way. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a question about teach me, teach me how you reason. Yeah, I think that links to the uncertainty point and how if we were all just a bit more aware that the world doesn't work in rights and wrongs and actually it's just fluid between <laughs> certainty and uncertainty, I think everyone would be a lot more open and a lot more not, this is my way and I don't care. <laughs> like you mentioned the question earlier about um, so how do you know this patient is dying? I've actually asked that. So Dr. McFarland, like, in my head, I was like, oh God, I'm going to get a telling off. But actually he was like, no, no, I know this because this 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 and it was one of the best things ever and now I always think about it because I'm like how can I tell if a person because it's you think you can tell when someone's dying but no you can't I think you can but also in my head I'm like how do you know because they're like oh yeah they're dying I'm like, I don't understand so Mark when I, when I was listening earlier you were saying about how um so you were talking about um, patients on the ventilator and how you can put them on their front to help them breathe and things and how we have so much uncertainty now my brain put those two points together to remind me of something that I was reading around so on Twitter because all I do is a lot of my life is just scroll on Twitter and look at what all the random doctors say about their practice and I remember when COVID first happened it was such an uncertain situation everything was no one could explain anything no one knew what was going on and everyone was just trying different tips and what I noticed as like a side spectator scrolling through this twitter was that actually twitter is quite cool because you get to be like a fly on the wall but what I was noticing was that a lot of doctors were talking about oh we've tried this at our hospital and we've tried this at our hospital you try this you should try this and people were just taking each other's ideas because everything was uncertain and we didn't know what was right and wrong um and one of the things that came up were in terms of some people saying actually put patients prone on the front because that helps them breathe and then someone else saying oh but how do we know that works and all of this to me it reminds me of epistemology and the thing is how it, so having to rely on anecdotal evidence in such a uncertain situation do you think it would have been good for everyone to have been educated and know about epistemology in that in that situation yes it's interesting that, that you uh that you bring up COVID because it it is quite relevant to many of these discussions and I, and i was um it, i don't know if you recall but seattle was the first community outbreak of COVID in the united states and so we had all of the first hospitalizations in mm -hmm. our region um and while i was taking care of critically ill patients. So it was also quite interesting to observe how we were taking care of those patients. And I frankly, there was a huge amount of variability in practice, even in our own institution between physicians um, and within the community. And, and I do think the short answer to your question is um, it probably would have been better if people understood a little more about epistemology so we could at least understand why we were, why our practices were so variable. Um, and there's a lot of problems with having that much variability in practice. Um, it's also important to recognize epistemology is not everything because a huge amount of the variability was based on psychology, was um, convinced it was the psychology of the clinician. There were clinicians who simply could not not do something, right? So the idea that they had this new illness with very critically ill patients and we need to do something like different than what we just, than what we usually do with critically ill patients with a viral pneumonia, which is take care of them, you know, to support them. Right? So, um, and so, so putting away aside this, the psychological ramifications, there was a huge amount, there was this very interesting epistemic process going on. A lot of people were arguing from, from ph physiology, right? This physiology, uh, the patient's physiology, things like hydroxychloroquine were, were arguments from, you know, um, how the drug behaved with the virus in tissue, 
samples, right? You know, right? And, um, and so um, there was a lot of pathophysiologic reasoning going on. A lot of it was really terrible. Um, so this is another argument for trying to get people to be better at other aspects of using medical knowledge beyond just looking at clinical research. We should be better at reasoning from physiology um, when we need to use it. And then your point too about the, it was sort of this unsystematic in an evidence-based medicine world would be called unsystematic clinical experience, right? Which is at the very bottom of every hierarchy. And yet it's what we had. Uh, there was, there was about 30 of us in the, in the greater Puget Sound region, all on our, on a text thread, telling each other what we were seeing and what we were doing and trying to make sense of what was going on around us. It was very useful and extremely powerful, you know, to be hearing from, you know, the, the, the first medical center to, to feel this onslaught. It, frankly, um, relying on published literature was really difficult. There was some published literature out of China where we looked at mortality rate. It's obviously a question like, what's the likelihood of surviving if you end up on, the, on mechanical ventilation with this disease? And the published literature out of China said it was 10%. And so we were, you know, there was a lot of people wondering, should we be putting anybody on the ventilator if the survival is 10% and particularly older patients or those who had medical comorbidities. But then when we're all talking to each other, it became clear after several weeks that people were coming off the ventilator and um, it wasn't gonna be 10%. And we didn't know right away what we were, what, what that percent was gonna be, but we knew it was better than 10 and it changed the way we practice. Um, and so, yes, there was a tremendous amount of value to unsystematic clinical experience and, and to pathophysiologic reasoning. And there were people who did it better than other people. and we learn as a community, you know, we, we could hash some of this, some, some of this out am, amongst one another. Um, there was also a lot of analogic uh, reasoning um, or reasoning by analogy, which was, is this different than another viral illness that causes ARDS or not? Um, there's this idea of COVID exceptionalism, like somehow it was fundamentally different than somebody with bad influenza or adenovirus, you know, pneumonia. And it was really, not and so there was a lot of the those discussions were going on as well um it was fascinating from an epistemic standpoint it was also fascinating from a psychological standpoint um that some of my most uh i would say uh, ardent evidence-based medicine colleagues um we're doing crazy stuff yeah you know, i mean we're, we're more than we're more than willing to more than willing to to cling to you know a lousy study, a case report, or, uh, you know, um, at, just so that we could do something, you know, the idea that we could do something. So I think it, it's, uh, yeah, it was, a, it's, it's fascinating. I know there are people who are doing research on how clinicians behave during this period of time. I'm really looking forward to some of it coming out. And I do think it'll be interesting to look at it from an epistemic standpoint and from a psychological standpoint, they are very, those are two different things. I would like to think that it was all an epistemic argument about what knowledge we could use, but it wasn't all that. I would add to the epistemic and the psychological that there's also an ethical aspect to this. So, you know, feeling like you need to do something is, you know, a very much an ethical position as well as a psychological uh, one. Um, there was a story in the New York Times a few months ago that looked at some of these issues and mm -hmm. they do a really nice job of sketching out uh, some of the frontline experiences and some of the arguments that people were having about, um, you know, in particular, putting people into clinical trials versus doing whatever you could for the patient. So listening to your experiences over COVID and thinking about how people were sort of working through the knowledge that they'd heard and heard through analogies and read through pathophysiology pathophysiological reasoning, um, it would have been really useful to have the skills to be able to do an epistemological analysis at the time and to be able to take in that information and think about what you're taking in. Um, so from people who have been listening and for people who resonated with that experience of COVID and just in general, and who are now excited about, you know, how can I sort of bring this into my life? What would you say is one step that people can take from now to put them on that path towards thinking more about epistemology? 
Um, so I think, Navilo, one of the, the things that you said earlier about the toddler who keeps asking why, I think just the attitude behind that, that, you know, if something is presented you, to you as being something we know or something we should be doing in that situation, don't be afraid to ask why, you know, that this is supposed to be the, the thing to do, or, you know, when given a, a piece of knowledge, like from a study, whether it's a clinical trial or a physiological study, just remember that the researchers who came up with this made a whole lot of decisions that went into the methods for, uh, that, that produced that result. And um, knowing that that's the case and asking why they made certain kinds of decisions is, um, Going to be really important, I think. So for just one simple example, um, the decision in a clinical trial of which kinds of patients to include. Do you include older patients? Do you include patients with comorbidities? The reason that there's a tendency to not include older patients or patients with comorbidities, it's, it's easier to get an answer that seems very precise. Um, but then there are other reasons for actually including them. And so not being um, hesitant to question the methods, not necessarily in the, the, with the goal of critiquing them or showing that they're wrong, but with the goal of showing that they actually did shape the results in some pretty important ways, I think is a, a really useful thing to realize is important. So those are, are some examples of what you call in the paper uh, epistemic analysis. Uh, what can someone do to uh, uh, to practice that? So, so I think, like many things in medical education, one of the most we're, we're talking about how to introduce students to these concepts and learners to these concepts. But you need um, faculty, right? People on the medical education side to feel comfortable um, d teaching this, right? And I and I don't know that we've you know in some ways this is like a this. This is like a new technology where sometimes it, it, um, the challenges are that the learners master it before the, the um, teachers do. So I do think part of this um, is emphasizing with medical educators the, the importance of being able to, um, to explain your clinical reasoning and to focus on you know, what you're appealing to. You know, and we talk about knowledge. You, um, Stephen Tillman's a philosopher who has a method of argument that fits very much with clinical reasoning that you know, talks about warrants, like, why are we doing this? Well, I'm giving this beta blocker because beta blockers are good for people with myocardial infarction. How do you know that? I know that because I have this paper you know, that tells me this and we can look at it in more detail. Or you could say, well, I know that because you know, your attending told you that last week and you somehow believe them, right? You know, you, you like her and she seems to know what she's talking about. So those are different backings for that warrant, right? But being able to have this kind of discussion and this willingness, like nobody to be like Nabila feeling like they can't bring up these questions when they come up and then being able to, to sort of walk people through this, this process. And I think the, the way you make it interesting to people is that you bring it up when they're interested in it, right? It's one thing to sit down in the class and try to teach people how to do this process. It's another thing to say, let's take, let's take advantage of this opportunity and, and discuss what knowledge we're relying upon here to come to this decision. Um, and being willing to do that. As you probably know, like you know, everybody in medical education knows that sometimes if you want uh, students to know that you're teaching them, particularly residents or you know um, trainees in graduate medical education, sometimes you need to go, oh, we're gonna take a moment and do some teaching, right? You have to frame it because otherwise you just taught for 10 minutes and they don't know they were, you know, when they say, were you taught anything? You're like, no, they never taught me a damn thing. Um, so I think sometimes it's important to just be able to say the same way. Well, let's stop and let's look at this. You know, I can see that people disagree or we're having a conversation about what the right thing to do is. Let's see if we can break this down um, more formally. What are you relying on, you know, to, to come to your conclusion? Oh, that paper. Well, I know that paper, so we'll, we'll talk about that. But what are, you know, is somebody else relying on? Oh, experience. How much experience do you actually have with this disease, right? So, um, and, and calling it out and saying, we're gonna do this now. Um, it doesn't take long, um, you know, doing and doing rounds. It's, it doesn't have to be, you know, a half hour on a whiteboard. It can be, you know, 
two minutes at the bedside. And then we at least understand, you know, how we're weighting knowledge and whether or not, you know, again, somebody is um, just unaware of a particular study or um, some other bit of knowledge. So, um, but, we, but we have to encourage our medical educators to be comfortable doing that. Um, it has to become a habit, if I hear you correctly. I, I think it's a good educational habit. Yes. Um, if you want to teach clinical reasoning, then you have to stop and make your reasoning explicit. We need more blue sky thinking and asking. <laughs> <laughs> I was just say, I think that was a great um, example. And, you know, there is, it is true that um, as Mario can probably attest, sometimes with the three year old, um, you just get tired of them asking those questions. <laughs> um, but I do think that that's our role, whether as a parent or as a medical educator, is to be as patient as possible and in trying to answer those questions. And we may get to a point where we just say, well, I don't know, um, right? We often do as parents, I don't know. Um, well, why don't you know? know? <laughs> yeah, and, and, then, yeah. and then that may be just, a, it may be that that's unknowable um, or it may be that, yeah, you just identified something I don't know and now we should try, maybe let's go see if I can figure that out. Mark and Robin, thank you very much for having this conversation with us. And I understand that you are writing a book about this uh, uh, subject. What is it about? It's. I think uh, a lot of what we talked about today um, is, is there as well. And the way we're really approaching it is trying to make um, epistemo epistemology relevant to medical practice. Um, it's written for medical educators and for practicing clinicians. So it's not a work that, um, you know, is, is for philosophers of medicine only. And, uh, but bringing a lot of these issues that have been written about in the philosophy of medicine and that are very relevant to clinical practice um, uh, in, into a form that people can understand and will Im hopefully improve uh, both medical education and clinical care, um, or at least make it um, a little more understandable. Great. And uh, thank you, uh, Nabila, for uh, co-hosting this uh, with me. And thank you for listening. And next time we're going to talk about something that actually we've been using it the whole time in this episode. This guy thinking. We're going to talk about language. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs>